It's not just China, Iran, we learn from various investigative reports, including one in Global News, has up to 700 foreign agents running around our streets. In, in fact, uh, many of them are whipping up these anti-Semitic hate marches. So that's a very manifest, uh, in-your-face, conspicuous form of foreign interference. Of course, it's using the, it's using the, the pawns on the chessboard of, of Canadian permanent residents and, and Canadian temporary uh, visa holders, but it's being orchestrated by Iran. No duty to warn there, no press conferences there. I find the whole thing very curious. But let's get to what the prime minister said today. You were following along, and we have a few clips that I saw you react to. Um, Let's play the first one. This is a clip from the Hogue Commission today. Uh, John, we'll play it for our viewers, and then I'd like your thoughts on it afterwards. Olivia, go ahead and put in the first clip. And if we can scroll down to paragraph 126. Um, Prime Minister, for, for your benefit, this is uh, a discussion about a succession of memos um, suggesting that um, essentially unclassified briefings be provided broadly to parliamentarians. Uh, and what we see here is that um, NSI COP made this recommendation in 2018 and 2019. Uh, and there are three memos that that were intended to go to you in some way, shape, or form. So one in December 2019 that was sent to PMO but never followed up on, and we heard from your staff that that sort of fell through the COVID cracks at the beginning of the pandemic. Um, one in December 2020, which was discussed within PMO but ultimately not actioned, and that the, the report mentions one in 2022, which was never finalized or even sent to PMO. Um, so just to confirm, first of all, that none of these memos ended up reaching you. Is that correct? Correct. Okay. Um, and we know that the, the this initiative of broadly briefing parliamentarians eventually did happen in June 2024. So if none of these reached you, um, first question I'd like to ask is, should this have happened earlier? And are you troubled that it didn't? Um, uh, my position has always been uh, that uh, providing more briefings to parliamentarians is a good thing. Uh, I am uh, fully in favor of it. We all receive uh, security briefings uh, when we first get elected on not leaving documents hanging around, being careful about when you're speaking about delicate matters in a restaurant or on an airplane or anywhere people can overhear. Uh, we learn the basics of um, phone hygiene and how you how to keep uh, keep your your, your information um, secure uh, and I'm a huge believer in empowering uh, empowering uh, parliamentarians to be able to be uh, safe and thoughtful in how they do things the briefings to parliamentarians that you receive when you get elected uh, and security briefings ongoing um, are not directed by the government of the day. They're directed by the House of Commons itself, the Sergeant at Arms, if it's a matter of security, uh, the Speaker's office. You know, briefings to all parliamentarians uh, is not in general something that the, uh, the government of the day uh, is directly involved in. Um, but these these various documents are certainly something of these these you know CSIS has um, the authorities to uh, go to um, either the speaker or the sergeant at arms and and request for those briefings. These briefings didn't get to me, but uh, these decision points didn't get to me. But uh, I made it very clear throughout conversations that I would have um, that I would have approved of or encouraged briefings of parliamentarians. There is a process that I see regularly invoked. Um, about every week or so, I sit down with the clerk of the Privy Council, and we go over you know, changes to uh, the senior ranks of the public service. We talk about particular issues that are coming forward. And part of our regular meetings is 
uh, the clerk highlighting, okay, there's this note that we sent to your office uh, that has been there for a week or two or, or for too long, and we need a return on this uh, because uh, this is important and we need this to be acted on. And I'll say, okay, we'll follow up and we dig it up from the pile of notes that we get and make sure that we prioritize that. Uh, in this case, uh, nobody, neither CSIS, uh, through their minister to me or directly to the clerk or to the NSIA uh, flagged that this was something that was of, of, uh, of importance to them that was stalled. Um, and there, therefore, as you pointed out, they, they were not acted on in my office. You know, um, I don't want to call Trudeau a stupid man because I don't think he is. He's, a, he, he's, he's not a serious man. Um, I'm told by people who know him that he spends most of his free time reading science fiction books. So he just chooses not to be briefed. He, we, we learned in past meetings of this commission of inquiry that staff would have to read him Cease's notes like a bedtime story because he literally would not, could not read them himself. He just didn't care enough. They, they treated him like a child that way. So so he's sort of stupid in that he chooses not to know things, but he's obviously not stupid if he can win election after election after election. He has what's sometimes called an EQ, sort of an emotional intelligence. And what I saw there is a guy who was talking out the clock. He was asked specific questions of why he didn't see security briefings, and he started with a five-minute story about how when you go to Parliament, you're told not to leave documents around. He's just... I mean, there's no other way to say it. He's a bullshitter. And and that works on 99% of the press gallery. And the 1% it doesn't work on are not allowed to ask him questions anyway. Um, I, I mean, I'm... It, it wasn't a spectacular, catastrophic answer like you might see from Kamala Harris because she's not as good a talker as him. But I think we have a fool as a prime minister. What do you take away from that long ramble we just heard? I'm afraid I agree with you by and large. Uh, I mean, he avoided the most catastrophic uh, way that he sometimes presents. He didn't do the sneering glibness, which would have created endless disastrous clips. But his testimony was not intended to tell us what the foreign threats are to the country and how afraid we should be of them. It was all about how none of it was his fault. And it's rather peculiar listening to it because on the one hand, he didn't get the briefings. The memos didn't get to him, but that wasn't his fault. It's not as though he created the expectation that he shouldn't hear about these things. But at other points, he would say, well, look, what's in those briefing points was never said to me. On the other hand, it didn't need to be because this sort of thing had come up in other conversations. So at the one and the, one and the same time, he was never informed of anything that it might be embarrassing to know why he didn't act on it. But on the other hand, he wasn't clued out. He knew everything because, of course, he had these deep conversations with people of which there is no record and on which he cannot be pinned down. And the overall effect, though, he is good at it. Again, I agree with you that he is not a stupid man, but he is not a wise man. But he totally missed the point. If you want to rebuild trust, if you want to have a rational discussion, those in power need to tell us not just when they knew things or what they knew, they need to tell us what's going on. Who are these MPs whose loyalty is suspect or whose judgment is obviously terrible? How big are the threats to Canada? Where are they coming from? And what really is being done about it? And instead, Trudeau did a very kind of put you to sleep performance mm -hmm. about how he himself couldn't be proved to have done anything wrong. And even though it was a good performance, it was it was a good answer, but to the wrong question. Because the question is, how badly is Canada penetrated by hostile foreign actors from Islamists to communists? And this is not an unreasonable question, even if sometimes people, including sometimes people in Parliament, put it in ways that could be improved on. And he didn't even try to address it. In fact, he tried not to address it. And so no matter how good his performance was today, it was terrible because we still don't know. And we know that he's not going to tell us what he knows. He's not even going to let us figure out how much he knows that he's not telling us and how much he just doesn't know hmm. deliberately or through incapacity. So in that sense, you know, it was one of these disastrously successful performances. <laughs> you know, um, Canada used to be part of uh, a Justice League, if I may use a comic book phrase. Um, you know, there's the good guys, there's NATO, but NATO is a pretty big group. G7 is a pretty group, 
be group G20, but there was a group called the Five Eyes. Uh, super friends, you could call them. The close, close friends. It would be like on Facebook. You, have, you can be friends with somebody you don't really talk to, but you have close friends. And this group of five people called the Five Eyes was the United States, the United Kingdom, Australia, New Zealand, and Canada. We were part of the super friends. And we're not really part of that group anymore. NATO had a an exercise we did not attend. There's this new group called AUKUS, Australia, UK, and US. It's a military and trade alliance. We weren't even invited. We used to have something called Operation Maple Flag, which was like a an exercise, um, a, a, like a Top Gun exercise in Alberta every year. We don't have that anymore because we just don't have aircraft that can fly along with the rest of NATO. We have slowly been pushed out of the good guys club, not in a spectacular way. No one has shamed us. Donald Trump tried to shame uh, Trudeau a bit about our underspending, but I don't think it's just that we don't have a strong military anymore. I think it's that we're not serious diplomatically anymore. And I actually think that the penetration of our system by foreign interferers, communist China especially, but also Iran and others, I actually think that Washington, D.C. does not trust Trudeau or the Canadian government. And they're not, they're not being angry. They're not being noisy about it. They're just sort of backing away from us, and they've made new friends. And I, I think that's happening. What do you think about that? It is happening, and it's a very shameful and dangerous thing. I mean, the, the five eyes, it's interesting. Another way of describing them is the Anglosphere. Right. Mm. The United States, Great Britain, Australia, New Zealand and Canada. And I'm not going to go too far into that, although remember, Trudeau did infamously say that politicians from Quebec were much better than uh, politicians from the English speaking part of the country. Maybe he was not entirely right about that. But one of the problems here is that anybody who's even partway serious about security knows that Canada is a soft touch, not just for terror groups that we let operate here, that we finally, you know, banned Samadun, but also for money laundering. And there was just this huge problem with one of our major banks. Yeah. We don't police international crime of all sorts, and our allies know it. They can't trust us. Our politicians are frivolous, our institutions are complacent and mediocre, and we're just not the country that we were, vital in both world wars, a key ally in the Cold War, someone you could count on to do the right thing, even if like all politicians, ours tended to do some silly stuff, like the Soto American ones. But we've lost that status. And I I don't know why they're so shy about shaming us. It might help wake us up, but they know. They know that you let the guy with the socks do his selfies and things. And then once he's out of the room, you have the serious discussions. And we ought not to tolerate this. I mean, again, you can't always just blame the politicians. We're the voters. This is still a self-governing society. I call the picture of Dorian voter. The more hideous they look, Mm. the more we should worry about how we're behaving. But for whatever reason, and this comes back to the subject of the inquiry, Canada is badly penetrated by hostile actors, and the whole focus of our elite is making sure that we never find out what's happening, rather than saying, yeah, this is a big problem. We trust you, the citizens. We're going to put it on the table for you. If we made mistakes, we're going to confess, but let's get it fixed. And that's the last thing they're ever going to say, so our status will just continue to dwindle. Yeah. You know, you're so right about the socks. I remember Trudeau's first big international trip after he was elected in the fall of 2015. It was actually the World Economic Forum in Davos in January 2016. And he went and he took a huge entourage and he had photos taken of him with U2, the band and and all these Hollywood types. And he met with George Soros. When he, and he was showing everyone his fancy socks, which he was really into. And people, the first time he showed Angela Merkel his fancy socks, like it, it would be like you're at a cocktail party and someone shows you, a, uh, tells you a funny joke. Okay, <laughs> that's cute. Okay, can we get back to why we're meeting here? I have such a packed agenda. I have so many serious things to say. So Trudeau would do his fancy socks thing. And the other leaders were wise to sort of laugh at first. Okay, fine. He's got this quirk. But it was all fancy socks all the way down. There was nothing underneath the fancy socks. There, so he would have these unserious tricks. And very soon, you would see all these video after video, and they weren't just selectively edited, of him at these NATO meetings, G20 meetings, by himself. No one sought him out. If he sat down next to someone, 
They didn't immediately dive. Oh my gosh, I'm so glad I caught you, Justin Trudeau. There's something I've been meaning to say about a very important file we have in common. No one ever says that to him because as he testified before an ethics commission inquiry, when he was in trouble for taking the free trip to Billionaire Island, he doesn't get briefed on things. He's all about relationships. He leaves the heavy staff to others. I, I really think he's undone our country. Oh, hi, it's Ezra Levant here in Toronto with an important message because we need your help. Independent journalism in Canada is under attack. Government censors, big tech deplatformers, and the dying legacy media are all working together to maintain exclusive control on the information you receive. They don't want you to hear other voices like ours, and they really don't want you to be informed and to think for yourself. That's why the work we do here at Rebel News is so important. Our on-the-ground reporting, independent news shows, and special content you won't find anywhere else. It's all designed to give you trustworthy information and alternative viewpoints so you can decide for yourself. We don't get government money, and we are not owned by some big global conglomerate. We're funded by people just like you, so please support independent journalism and help us continue our work by subscribing and becoming a Rebel News Plus member today, right here on the page. Go to rebelnewsplus.com. Members get instant access to all of our shows, invitations to exclusive events, and access to our premium content like live event footage and documentaries you won't see anywhere else. Only Rebel News Plus members can join the conversation by participating in the comments section of our new website. That way you can have your say too. More than anything though, you'll be able to take pride in supporting real, honest journalism and you'll help our talented team continue to do the work to push back on the establishment. We really can use your help. We need it, in fact. So thank you and enjoy Rebel News Plus.